On December 8th at the Queen Anne's County Commissioners meeting, Dr. C. Atola met with the commissioners to give an update on COVID-19 and the upcoming vaccine. Well, it's going to be some good news and some bad news, but it's going to be the truth. It's going to be transparent. First off, I'd like to say thank you for allowing us to do this update tonight. And what I'd like to do before I show you the PowerPoint is just give you a brief statement where we are today, the 8th of December. We get a daily COVID surveillance numbers from the state. And that breaks down essentially the percentage of positivity of the state, the seven day rolling average, as well as the seven day case rate. On November 1st, now remember now, this is usually two days behind of what's really happening. November 1st, Queen Anne County, with the state average being seven day positivity of 3.8% and the seven day case rate per 100,000 statewide was 13.7. Queen Anne County at that time had a positivity percentage of 4.4% and a seven day case rate of 11.3. Percent? Or is that the 11.3? The case rate, case per 100,000. So basically, with 11.3, that meant we had 5.4 positive cases that day because they double our case rate because of our population. Mm. Okay. Well, today is the 8th of December. What has occurred since the 1st of November, the state average now for percent positivity, seven day, was 7.6% this morning. The seven day case rate for the state was 44.8. That's up from, what'd you say, 13? 13.7. 13.7. Wow. Queen Anne County. Now remember where we were November 1. November 1, we were sitting at a case rate, and I go by this case rate more than the positivity percentage because it's actually showing us the number of positive cases we're experiencing in this county. November 1, remember, we were 11.3. Today, we are 35.4. So 17. <laughs> Excuse me. That's 17 then? 17. And that's truly what we have been averaging. Now, granted, we did have one day where we had 46 positives. Now, the PowerPoint. I'm going to show you some other statistics. <clears throat> It's on. Should be on, yeah. Bruce is going to check in. Basically, I'm going to show you the data. This data on PowerPoint was put together with data up to and including November 30th. Go ahead and just push the next slide. Sure thing. All right, this compares where we were statewide and jurisdiction wide on the 30th. On when? 30th of November. 30th, okay. Okay. Now, if I add the first eight days of December, we are sitting now at 1,351 confirmed cases. We still fortunately or unfortunately have not had any increase in deaths 
We have 23 total deaths in the county since the first part of March. 18 of those deaths occurred in our long-term care facility with their outbreak. Five have been in our general population. We've had approximately 65 individuals hospitalized. Now, the next slide. Got the next slide? Okay. Dr. C, is that the 65, did that not change the hospitalizations even though we jumped to 1365? Correct. So we're, okay. So actually our hospitalization percentage went down. And I'll show you now. which button to go advance, the right. Yep. This is broken down since March, every month, the number of positive cases that we've had in Queen Anne County. And I draw your attention to November. Realistically, we've added an additional 43 patients because this data was, de was developed on the 30th of November, but we've had subsequent positive cases that have come in that were tested three or four days before the end of November. Okay. And we go by the date that they're tested to report them as positives, not the day the report comes in. So in November, we had a total of 375 positive cases. It is the highest speak, peak and spike that we have had since the beginning of this pandemic. Where we sit in December, as of the today, 127 positive cases already. In six days? Yeah. And actually, it's four days, because are you testing Saturday and Sundays? No. So in four days, you've got 100 and how many? Now remember, some of these are point of care test. We count those as a positive because if that's a positive point of care, it has to be verified with a PCR nasal swab, but for data, it's considered a positive. So is that two for one person then? Hmm? No, it's not two. So when, if I went and tested and then wound up going to the hospital and getting tested again, they'd only count my positivity as one? One time. Okay. Next, oh, I got the slide. But you said that was 121? 127. Did we have a peak of people coming in to get tested right after Thanksgiving? Who, because that there was <clears throat> less week, testing the week off. Last Thanksgiving. week, we tested about 850 people in Queen Anne alone. And what was what's our average on a week that we test? Our average week or average month mm -hmm. is about anywhere from 1,200 a month to 1,500. Our highest month was July when we had the outbreaks in all the restaurants in the mm -hmm. Narrows, and we had to test everybody. We tested 3,300 people. That's only what we're testing. Shore Regional Health at the college is testing Monday and Wednesday. Mm -hmm. We have a couple of the practices that are testing their patient panels, and we also have people going for rapid tests who wanted to travel and have gone to urgent cares and some of them have even gone to Middletown in Delaware. There's an urgent care there, and they're doing a lot of testing. So if they go to, to Delaware, they'll report back you to still get the report back. Okay. So the 850, Doc, is, is that, are those people coming in, are they symptomatic when they're coming to get tested just because they want to get it's tested? A, it is a is mix of all. Okay. It's people who want to travel. It's people who have been exposed. It's family members of an individual who is positive, And it is some symptomatic. Okay, we do not require a physician's order to test. It is open to the general public. Are you, are you seeing people coming in with flu symptoms that are just worried they may have COVID and getting tested too, or is that? Believe it or not, the state has not reported any positive flu yet. Really? Well, that's great. People come in and complain, I got a sinus infection, or I got a scratchy throat. That's what the complaints are, but the tip off is when they get the fever of 100.4 or higher, they lose their sense of smell and taste. Those are two of the key signs early. Yes, sir. Hospitalizations from Queen Anne's County? We currently have four individuals in the hospital. Last week we had five. 
show you some data. Let me ask you real quick. Of those new cases we have from December, do we have a feel for how many of those folks traveled for Thanksgiving or had company come into town for That's Thanksgiving? That's contact tracing. Yeah. And the problem with contact tracing now is a huge overload to NORC, which is the primary contact tracer providing the information not only where they work, where they've traveled, what is their occupation, and what we've looked at with the contact tracing that we're also doing with the use of our epidemiologist, Ravish, that we have in the health department that we hired contractually. The majority of the positivity is due to gatherings, both family and larger family and friend gatherings, not necessarily travel. Mm. Okay. Now, we broke this down by cases by age group. And as you can see, the majority of the patients that we're getting for positivity is, is between the age of 25 and 64. We broke down our school-age children, zero to 19. We were at one point early in this, in the summer, running about 24% positivity for our zero to 19. That has come down to less than 19% right now. You ask about deaths. This is where we stand. And it shows you the monthly hospitalization <coughs> and our monthly death occurrences. Since August, or really since July, we've had only two deaths out of a population of essentially 55,000. I think that's pretty incredible. So and you said you, five hospitalized, but you have nine up there. That's nine throughout the entire month. Is that uh, correct? Nine is not current. That's what we have total current right now. We have four in the hospital. Last week we had five, and I suspect that talking to the hospital today, two of the four will probably be discharged this week. Okay. Right now, at a meeting with the, all the health officers and Dr. Huffner from Shore Regional Health, right now the hospital has their highest number of positive COVID cases since the pandemic started. They have 15 in positive cases, they have about, I think, 10 to 15 that were pending PCR tests. Only one of those 15 is in the ICU and not on a ventilator, okay? They can't say that for Can't say spring. that for, you can't, yeah. You the can't I mean, the ventilators is, is the key, I think. In, in and what I'd like to show you with this slide, this shows you the hospitalization by age. This shows you the severity of the age group we have to be worried about. Whew. Technically, 65, yeah, you're, you're in good shape, Phil. Behave <laughs> yourself. Yes, sir. <laughs> yes, sir. When you look at 65 and older, this is where our greatest risk is for both severity as well as the possibility of death. And that's where our deaths have come from. Is, is a lot of that still circling back to you that you're finding from as pre-existing conditions uh, associated Absol with it? Absolutely. Pre-condition, pre-conditions. <laughs> the morbidity from diabetes, congestive heart failure, lung disease, COPD, and marked obesity have a greater propensity for significant negative outcomes. And this shows you the age breakdown. <clears throat> Basically what we have had the graph. And you see the deaths have occurred. We had one 50 year old who had significant comorbidities and he was our youngest death. But over 75, that's where the majority of the deaths are. So, 
So, so the 95 to 105, obviously everybody in that age group died, but only one was hospitalized. Did, were they in elder care or something that they died in elder care? Or? Some of, most of those have died in either assisted living or they were in the hospital and died at home, not in the hospital. They had been discharged. Okay. Where it was hospice. They were discharged positive and still were allowed to be discharged? They were discharged to hospice. Oh, okay. 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 Because it was palliative care at that point. Gotcha. Now, there's been a lot of requests from the citizens about what zip codes are the positive zip codes. <laughs> there you go, folks. I think that's a little misleading because it doesn't give you what the percentage of those total populations are. But it gives you by zip code. Right. So if That's you right. look if you look at Centerville, right. it's pretty much Centerville. But if you look at Graysonville, Stevensville, Chester, and Graysonville, I mean that's that gives you a pretty good idea of where your population is. Mm -hmm. And here's a graph that basically shows where it's all broken down. So Centerville's the highest? Is that Centerville's the highest, okay. Mm -hmm. Centerville's the highest, yeah. Damn. Mm -hmm. Well, but again, highest number, but highest number based on its population. What, it, right, right. Right, it could be the same as anyone else. So, so the people wanted to know, they've been asking us, so I provided this, and I believe that they're going to put this on QAC TV so that the public can have a chance to look at the graphs, the numbers, the percentage. So, I mean, I, I didn't know people were asking for this, but what's the significance of it other than if the, the more it's, populated it's areas? Back in the spring, back in the spring, people were concerned when our numbers were, were low and they were starting to climb that where is it? What zip code? I don't want to go to that zip code. Stay away from it. That's what the mentality. But, but I mean, it's it's the populous areas are always going to have a higher case rate. I the mean, that's just the numbers say so. Yeah, I mean, it's just the, yeah. It's based so, on numbers. It's based on community spread. We have widespread community spread. In Queen Anne County, it's all of Queen Anne County, right. period. Right. And where you have dense population, you're going to have a higher percentage of cases. That makes sense. So you, well, a higher number of cases, not necessarily a higher percentage. Well, a higher number. Right, right number. Yeah. I mean, as Jim was saying, I mean, if you had a town of 50, right. 17 people have it, that's your high percentage yeah. versus... Yeah, I'm looking at Marydale up there. It's almost the whole town. They got 27 people with it. <laughs> That's everybody. Right. <laughs> they got 100 percent. So they got 100 percent. Right. right. Yeah. All right. The good news: we probably will have vaccine next week. Okay. To the state. Right. So when will be here? Uh, I can answer that. <laughs> Just like we had testing material way back in March. Right. The way they're estimating it, it is going to. The 1A, which is hospital staff who are acutely involved in the care of these COVID patients and long-term care facilities and assisted living. Well, you had a meeting today with the other health officials, is that what you yes. said? I mean, I guess my wife's an ICU nurse and, and in her humble opinion, the vaccine should be going by the oldest in reverse because hospital care has the most PPE equipment than anybody. They're not getting, the nurses aren't getting I don't, sick in the hospital. I don't disagree with you. Right. And I think that these decisions are being made by the feds, by CDC. This is not a local decision. Okay. This is not a state decision. Well, and I think in part of it, it's not that they're gonna catch it at the hospital, is that we need them in health so they can care for people. So they might, if you're, you work in the hospital, but you might oh. catch it out at a gathering or something, but we need you to stay healthy. And we still don't know until after Thursday when the FDA comes out with their evaluation of both the Pfizer vaccine as well as the Moderna vaccine. Specifically, what contraindications are there? Who should take it? Who shouldn't take it? Okay. What type of side effects are we looking at? And what are the possible risk of a vaccine? We are going to probably get to the state 150,000 <laughs> doses. Here comes the good news. <laughs> well, I asked sure, Dr. Huffner, how much, because it's going to the hospitals, it's going to CVS and Walgreen have the contracts with the state with federal money to vaccinate the staff and the residents of long-term care facilities as well as assisted living. 
So that will take up pretty much all of that initial 150,000. But talking with Dr. Huffner, I said, how much is Shore going to get? And he said, at this point in time, anywhere from 700 to 1,000 doses. Now, we did work out an agreement because of the fact that this is the super cold vaccine. The hospital is receiving their deep freezer tomorrow. And what the five health officers have agreed to is we're going to regionalize our storage. There's no sense in five midshore jurisdictions trying to fight over dry ice because this thing has to be kept at minus 70 degrees Celsius. So the hospital will essentially be the depot for delivery, and then we will alloc we are, each jurisdiction will get an allocation. Dr. C, did you say minus seven degrees or seven? Seven, seven, zero. seven, zero. seven zero. It's like 110 Fahrenheit. Number Negative. one, the Pfizer vaccine has to then be defrosted. It has to be reconstituted and it's only good for four to six hours after it's been reconstituted. And how many doses do you, are, will you have to have, be taken? It just one it's shot two. will do it? It's two. Two. two Both of those vaccines, the Moderna and the Pfizer, are a double shot. Pfizer, I believe, is 25 days in between. Moderna's 21. Is it, is it no more than or no less than 21 days in between? It is no. It, it is right at that 21-day right window. At that window. mark. Can't do it early, and you can't do it later. The discussions that are going on with the CDC and with the state health department, specifically about the vaccines, is the identification, what mechanism they're going to try and record this. It will go into a system called Immunet, and that's where every vaccine goes so that you can get a record of your vaccine. You will also get a paper copy at the time because of the fact that we have to give the same brand of vaccine for the second shot. So if you get a Pfizer on January 2, your next shot's gotta be Pfizer. It can't be Moderna. And if J&J &J comes out with their vaccine before or after that, it has to be the same vaccine. So there's gonna be a logistical nightmare yeah. to try and keep track, and t not only time, but make sure that the individual receives the appropriate vaccine. So, so mathematically, you're saying if we get 150 doses, we actually are only gonna be able to inject 75 people. Is that, no, is that what you mean? No, because what the Fed is doing, if we get 150,000 doses to the state next week, maybe by the 14th, the Fed is holding the second set of those shots. They're not, dis but they will dispense them to us right before that 25th day. Okay. Hopefully not that afternoon of the 24th day. Yeah, I was gonna say, it's another logistical. Okay. Total. But that's the good news. At least Warp Speed has provided us with a vaccine. The other piece of the good news is yeah, our numbers are going up. They're really on a rocket trajectory right now. But thankfully, our hospitalizations haven't shot up in comparison to the number of positives. And I attribute that more to the age of the individuals that are getting this. But I cannot encourage the public any stronger than I can say, wear your face coverings, avoid large gatherings, wash your hands, and if you have flu-like symptoms, stay home. Do not go to work, and don't go visit your relatives. Doc, one last question on, in terms of, so I've heard different reports, read a few articles about it, and obviously I know there's some truth to it. So people who've had it, people who can test and have the antibody, should we not be testing people for that or with that predisposition so as not to basically waste a vaccine on them because they're well, we not at that, risk. We ask that question. Why give a vaccine to somebody who's already got it and have antibodies? Well, they've, test, they've done the vaccine on some of those people. And some of the discussion that we've had with the CDC and the state 
is they may recommend a single shot as a booster to their antibodies because okay. the question is we don't know enough about the virus and the presence of antibodies whether it's going to be three months whether it's going to be six months or whether you have it for a year we don't know so do, do you get like the first shot or are both shots equal it's just you're getting two of them to get the equal to the right doses is you're that getting you're getting the right antibody antigen response with two shots okay. And the symptomatology, listening to the news conference today, and we have a meeting tonight with all the state health officers, basically the symptomatology with the shot is like you have a mild case of COVID. You get a headache, you have a low-grade fever, you get some general muscle ache, and within 24 to 36 hours, it's gone. So, but so more to come. We don't know all the answers but at least there is a light at this tunnel. It may not be for the general population till maybe spring, depending on how fast and how much vaccine the federal government can get into the states. Hmm. So I'm open for any other questions. Have you, has, do you have any data that shows the severity of it now, the COVID now? I mean, I know that we've got, the numbers are skyrocketing, uh, but they're not on the same trajectory with those in the hospital. So those who aren't going to the hospital, are they, you know, uh, a bad cold? I mean, what, what, are they still losing taste, smell, pulse ox going down? Pulse ox, that's what we watch, okay? And we're doing in conjunction with the hospitals, people who are discharged like a day or two when they're stable coming home, we're actually doing patient monitoring devices and going, the hospital ask us to go out. We send our MIC team out mm -hmm. with the paramedic and the nurse to deliver the pulse ox, the blood pressure cuff, and then link them to their primary care so that there is a daily report so that we don't have the problem with an elderly individual who may be home alone mm -hmm. or with another loved one who is also older and not as well to monitor because what we have seen is when these patients, especially what we saw in the nursing home, they go bad real quick. So it's important that they're monitored to some degree after they're discharged from the hospital. And we've been doing that. And as far as severity, I look at hospitalization rate. And considering the number of increased cases and the fact that we have four people in the hospital, that's a pretty good sign that the majority of the individuals that are getting currently infected yeah, they're sick for maybe a week to 10 days, and they're pretty miserable that first five to seven days, but they're not to the point where they need to be hospitalized. I will say that that MIC unit is worth its weight in gold. It's the best, best program I think that we've ever rolled out of here, so yeah. kudos to you on that one. I mean, that just is really a great Come idea. On. You used a phrase, pol um, pulse ox? Pulse ox. Pulse ox. The little thing goes on your finger, tells oh, the okay. oxygen level. This is your oxygen content. Okay. <laughs> basically their vitals. Yeah. True. One of the blood pressure and they're mm -hmm. checking the pulse because the pulse ox shows the pulse as well as the O2 set. Any other questions, gentlemen? Steve. There are just a point, sir. So, November numbers, no surprise because of endurance and so on. Also Thanksgiving. So you're going to see some ramp now, but the real problem, I think, and I request your opinion, is that 10 day period from the 20th of December through January is going to be a shit storm. It's going to be <laughs> my French, okay? Number one, we're going to have Don't cut to, it and sugarcoat it. No, I'm not going to sugarcoat it <laughs> yeah. because number one, we're going to see a significant increase in cases. I'm more worried about my age bracket that may be exposed because of family visitation and everything else like that. And the third thing is, we're going to be testing the heck out of everybody because everybody's going to say, we've traveled, we want to get tested and doing three days a week, and then trying to plan for vaccination, and we don't have any more CARES money. I mean, we've been using contracted staff, mm -hmm. and come 31st of January, all of that staff, I'm gonna have to dig into funding from someplace. Are they all registered nurses? We're using both registered nurses and CNAs. I thought I heard that there was a possibility that there'd be some volunteering of registered nurses to, to man some of these 
Have you given any thought to that? Is that, a, is that true or not true? Or? They've looked at the Maryland Reserve Corps, mm -hmm. and we tried to do that when we set up the regional testing back in March and April at Chesapeake College. We got zero support. Really? Okay. Well, I think it might be different now because I think then more of a fear thing that we're, what we, I've got to go into this. The state has put out a request for vaccinators. Mm -hmm. Now, we've trained our EMS ALS providers to be vaccinators. They actually were with the nurses doing the flu vaccine when we were doing the flu through the drive through in the tents. I probably have 12 to 14 ALS clinicians who are trained and approved to vaccinate. And when we do a vaccination, we will be doing it in specific locations and I'm not gonna publicize it, okay? Well, I will tell you this much. My wife volunteers me all the time for things. I'm more than happy to volunteer her to give out shots for you. So whenever you need her, you call me and I'll make sure she's there. Okay. Fair enough. That's right. I think it's going to be very hard to keep people down on uh, December 31st into January 1st from celebrating the end of 2020. I, just, oh, yeah. I think yeah. you'll be very hard pressed to put a PSA yeah, out you know, there. It's going to work for that night. Normally, <laughs> we, we, we're, we're celebrating the arrival of the new year. Yeah. I think now everybody gonna, is. Hey, By the last the year and hello to next year. <laughs> <sighs> Memorial Day, gentlemen would be a true Memorial Day if this is all over by then. Amen. Oh, yep. Absolutely. Yep. Doc C, thank you very much for yep. you I mean, you stayed. You saying job. Thank you. You stayed it. leading edge through this whole thing from the very, very beginning. And, and I'll say it, and I hope the citizens of Queen Anne's County truly do appreciate all the knowledge and experience and commitment to this that you brought us. So thank you. Hopefully we will continue to weather this on a rather choppy sea yeah. and not 10-foot uh, swells. Thanks, Doc. Thank, thank you. you.